Greg, you know, I saw somebody write one time that you were one of the most important investigative writers in the country. And as I was reading the line, it, it occurred to me, you might be the last <laughs> investigative <laughs> reporter in the country. Uh, you know, w- look, he- here we all know the story. Uh, you know, commercial journalism has become nothing but a megalomaniac corporate uh, entity. I mean, that's what's happened. And you got a problem with that, right? I right. got a problem with it. But, okay. I, but, but, I, but I tell you something. It's good to know you're out there because what I am seeing is there are a lot of Greg Palace lookalikes that are showing up. And I think the reason they're showing up is because you're you're kind of making them show up. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's important. It was, and by the way, thanks to your uh, cohort, uh, Bobby Kennedy, for saying those nice words about me. As, <laughs> but I, I hope I'm not the last investigative reporter. <laughs> Actually, I may be the first returning to America. You know, it, yeah. uh, investigative reporting in America has uh, become a dangerous uh, occupation, not, not uh, just a question of getting uh, um, blown away in dangerous zones, mm-hmm. but... Uh, um, you know, Seymour Hirsch was fired by the New York Times. Yeah, yep. uh, he told me that. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, Bob Perry, who broke the Iran Contra story, canned by the Associated Press. Amy um, Goodman. I mean, we go on know, forever. And, and Greg Palast exiled. Yeah. To BBC. You know, I'm, I'm not. It's, it's not like I'm being exiled <laughs> no, across the no, water no, to you, report on my, Greg, on my own you, country. You, you are in exile. I, I hate to tell you, but you are in. You are in exile. Look, let me let me tell you something. Sure. Uh, we we joke about this, uh, but you know, without investigative reporting, the ball never moves for democracy. I mean, that sounds like a ridiculous, simplified overstatement, but it is true. The ball never moves for democracy, because the world can't take place in a secret and confidential way. You can't, you know, everything can't be secret and confidential and still have an open. Uh, uh, democracy. It just can't well, exactly. They tell you to vote on something. That's like sticking your hand in the bag and just pick out a, pick out a number. Yeah. You know. I mean, they don't tell you what's on. You so, know. So, um, so let, yeah, let so me. That's been one of the one of the big problems. Yeah. Let, let me let me talk about let me talk a little bit about your background. First of all, because mm-hmm. I, I think it's such an important part of every story you take a look at. You know, if you talk to I've I've met some pretty good investigative journalists over the years. I'm news editing major. And I've had the chance to meet some pretty good ones out of University of Florida and other places. And you know what? They all have something in common. And you know what? It's, it's, it's anger. It is a little bit of anger that's always right below the surface. And the anger is always well justified. Yeah. I take a look at your history. Go back to the 1970s. You were studying finance under Milton Friedman. Uh, how, how do you go from there to where you are today? What, what? Exactly that. I mean, I was there when the free market... Uh, mania was born. New yeah, global this, order. This huh? little, this little dwarf. His feet wouldn't touch the ground, telling us that we're all going to be saved if we eliminate all the rules. Just get rid of all the traffic lights, everyone. <laughs> pedal to the metal, and hopefully, you know, laissez for everything. You no, know, you won't be. You know, yeah, kissing someone else's headlights. Yeah. Um, the problem is, I saw because I saw it at the beginning, as opposed to you know the the Milton Friedman light through Thomas Friedman. I saw where it was going to crash where it was going to go. And I was very, very concerned because, by the way, when I was there, one of the other things he was doing is he, he was testing out, experimenting. Uh, the University of Chicago economists were experimenting their, on um, their free market concepts mm. um, in Chile. Mm. And uh, the way Trickle they conducted— Trickle-down disaster the, there, yeah. yeah. If they conducted—if you disagreed with the way they debated, they, they cut out you. your tongue or they put a bullet through yeah. your head. So the, the debate was very short on the issue of free markets. Okay, let, let me ask you something. Chicago Tribune, a couple mm-hmm. of other places, talk, talk about the fact that at the heart of an investigative journalist is that you have to be a fanatic for documents, especially the ones that are marked secret and confidential, yeah. the ones that are locked up in cabinets at the FBI and World <laughs> Bank and U.S. Justice Department, State Department. That is all— that that's all about you. And, yeah. and, and I think about, uh, I, I love, the, the, how do you talk, talk to you about investigative journalism without talking about Exxon Valdez? Th- this is yeah. a story, when I take a look at the way that you put the parts of it together, it, it's, it, it, the reason it looks so different than any of the other reporting is because the other reporting, it looked like they approached it with a dead brain. You didn't. No, but, they approach well, it with, you know what they do? Most reporters, unfortunately, have gone to journalism school. Which I well, I'm sorry, I, I say I, I did. I, I'm a University <laughs> well, of Florida. Well, but, but somehow you you've greatly overcome it. <laughs> and the problem is that they learn how to write from press releases to deadline. You got three days. Yeah. Some of these investigations take months, even years. And the thing is, I love documents marked secret and confidential. By the way, you have it. Go to www.gregpalace.com. Um, don't burn it. 
don't shred it, send it to me. <laughs> if it's a secret confidential, bury this. I don't even know why they put secret on it. Like I have a great FBI document that says secret in big words and eyes only. No kidding. It's like mm. it's like you know like uh, Sam Spade stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I go, why do they put secret? That's the first thing I go for. Yeah. Of course, I've got to go get it. <laughs> And uh, that takes a lot of work. <laughs> without and, and subpoenas and without the right to be able to yeah, use the court well, system. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. I, that's right. And yeah. I do try to work with trial attorneys as much as I can to, to get what they well, can get. If you think about it, that's the only source nowadays. I mean, you're not going to get it from government. Uh, you know, every, every, whatever, every day. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, the whistleblowers, though, tie into what happens in the civil justice. The lawyers oh, get yeah. the documents. I, I get them all the time. And, oh, yeah. Okay, well, look, look, let's let's start with this story because I, I love this story. Yeah. The Exed Valdez story is so so poorly understood because mm-hmm. because Exxon had some great PR people who tried to synthesize to the story the story of this that some drunk idiot captain caused this problem. Nothing could be further from the truth when you analyze the story, could it? That's right. What the problem is is that they were we were sold on drunken skipper hits reef that this guy hit a reef. This is 20 years ago, by the way, this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that a guy hit a, gre- a reef because he was drunk, like he's at the wheel. He wasn't at the wheel. He's sleeping it off. Here's the here's the, what they didn't tell you, because the reason you got that story is that Exxon wants to make a human error. In fact, it was corporate fraud. And so I was an investigator for the Chugach natives, the people whose coastline was slimed, their lives destroyed by Exxon's oil. What I found is number one, the radar was off. They, this is before GPS, so they had kind of a pre-GPS system. It was expensive to run, expensive to train, so it was cheaper to turn it off. Mm, too expen- sh- to, and, and disabled, too expensive to fix the ones that was broken, right? right? If, if it was on, a three-year-old could have taken it through the narrows. It wouldn't have happened. Number two, and I'm looking at documents as we speak. You'll just have to take my word for it. I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, Joe McCarthy, I've got documents No, here. no, we, we, this story has been backed up. Since yeah, you, no, they, I, only well, after, you, only you, after you wrote it, by the way. But, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I have to say that the difference between me and Joe McCarthy is I actually have the documents. <laughs> um, and internally— But you still have, have no shame. We have <laughs> these promises by Exxon and its partners that they would leave oil spill equipment at strategic points along the Alaska coast— in particular, at Bly Island, right where the ship hit, which would you know surround the ship with the right, with right. boom with uh, floats that would keep the oil in, they wouldn't you wouldn't have even read about this ship if they had the equipment there. But you know what? How they dealt with putting the equipment there? They lied. They did it. The okay, let, they, let's. They literally made it up. Okay, so that's let, let's start. Let's documents. start. Let's start with the lie because yeah. every every story that you see about corporate misconduct like this, I mean, it's corporate criminal conduct is what it is. It is. Th- this story really begins. It begins with a representation as early as nineteen around nineteen seventy, where Exxon, where well, Humble Oil and Arco back then, right? They represented to the to, to these Alaskan natives that. They wanted the land. They wanted this this terminal land so they could create a, a pipeline. Start, so, so the story starts there. Okay, it starts in 69 when a helicopter lands in the middle of the ice and a meeting with natives who are fisher, seal fishermen, right? Right. He said, we want the Port of Valdez, the, most, the only single place you can have a port in all of Alaska that won't get hit by an earthquake or icebergs. Mm-hmm. So it's an unbelievably valuable piece of land. And the natives saying... If America needs this oil, we will give it to you for one dollar. Mm. One dollar. Mm. That's all they asked yeah. for for a, a billion dollar property. Right. But they said we want something in return. You know, we may have little canoes and kayaks or little fishing boats, but we know this: you're going to need state of the art radar. You're going to need to put out equipment. You're going to make us a promise that you're going to use state of the art protection so that you don't destroy what is our home. This water is our home. Prince William Sound. I mean, there's fishing yeah. and seal hunting grounds. Was. That's what they want. They wanted protection. They said, look, you can have, right. we're going to, we will, we will give this to you, but we want something in exchange, not money. We just want to, we want our livelihood, basically. That's right. They said, look, we'll give you the property for $1 and a promise. First was, and they literally put in state of the art radar. That's the radar that was turned off by mm. Exxon on the mm-hmm. Exxon Valdez. So it's called the Raycast radar. They asked for that. The natives. Well, this, let me ask you. Let me yeah. let me ask you this. It, not mm-hmm. only did they talk to the to to the natives on that ice flow that were hunting and fishing, yeah. they also went to Congress and they told Congress that they were going to do all of these things, put all these federal safeguards in place, and that there's no way that an oil spill was going to be a problem. It was going to be a problem because they had a plan. Tell us what the plan was. Oh, my God. I'm looking at it. They filed under oath a plan, 
a, a plan that they will have remote equipment set out, which, by the way, they did sign papers that the remote equipment to stop spills was put out, which they did the cheap way. All they did was put on a signature on a piece of paper, right, but there was right. no equipment. Yeah. They said that they would hire the natives. Well, wait, wait, but back up, yeah. back up, and they said because it it's easy, to, it's easy to miss that. When they said they had the equipment, when they said it was in place, that was a lie. They they, they yeah. didn't. It wasn't in place, and obviously they had, they had no intention of doing what they said they were going to do. Is that they, is that they, accurate? Exactly. They saved millions. They literally signed pieces of paper saying that the equipment was out there. But they figured, hey, who's going to check? There's just a bunch of seals and, and Eskimo mm. out there. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we don't need to to actually put that stuff out. That stuff costs millions. In fact, one year before the spill, a year before the spill. Uh, a vice president of the uh, of Exxon's operation called uh, the Alyeska Pipeline, a guy named Polasek, said, we don't have equipment where we're supposed to have equipment. I need – send me a few million bucks, and I'll put out safety equipment. This is a year before the spill. Yeah. And they said, absolutely no way. He didn't say it's a good idea. He says the law requires us. Mm-hmm. Well, that's like saying, well, we don't need brakes because that just adds, you know, expense to the car. Tell, tell us about the, the this secret meeting that took place, 1988. Uh, yeah. Aleska, the vice president, T.L. Uh, what was this? Polasek. Polasek. Yeah. And tell us, happened? tell us about that meeting and how this fits into the ongoing, not just the original lie to the Eskimos. I mean, to the to the natives. Not just the original lie to Congress and taxpayers that they were going to make all this safe. Not just the original lie signing a document when they knew they didn't have the equipment. But this is the continuation of the lie. What is that part? Oh, that there was a meeting of the top executives of the biggest oil companies in the planet who are all together on and shipping oil out of Alaska. That's British Petroleum. That's Exxon, Mobil. Um, they were all there, mm-hmm. okay? And the top executives meeting in Arizona, right? They're not going to go up and get get cold. They're going to be at a resort, right, uh, where it's nice and toasty golf. warm. Golf. It's and, what, you know, they're it's gonna, what they're boring gonna, They're meeting in their do. golf carts. They got out of their golf carts, and they got the Polisec memo saying, my God, we don't have spill equipment. If there's ever a spill, God forbid, mm. we have no way to contain this thing. And it's going to take millions. And actually, British Petroleum executives said, "Well, I guess that's American law. We got to kind of do it." They didn't know. They didn't know. They, you know, they, they're from you know, they're from London. Right? You can't destroy and, entire and, waterways. And yeah. Exxon said, "If you dare, because they have to split the cost. If you dare spend that money, we will charge it back." And they, Exxon went went livid over the idea that money would be spent to comply with the law. It's easy to comply with the law. You just sign a piece of paper saying the well, stuff well, is there. Well, okay, but but let's but to even make it clear, natives were demanding this because yeah. they said, look, look, let's go all the way back to the beginning of 1969. You've said you're going to do this. We're now in 1988. They're still not comfortable with what these oil companies have done. They're, they still understand how exposed they are. So, so the oil companies know that uh, and they're actually telling people that they have the ability to do this that they can train people from to drop from helicopters in the water with special equipment to yeah. contain oil slicks on a moment's notice and that they have it's a it's a sham it's a, the whole thing is a complete scam because they tell people they have these people hired to do this but it's a lie yeah they promised they said look we've hired all these natives to train, to to literally jump from helicopters in the water, put down the safety equipment. They're all trained up, ready to go, because they're required to have response teams in case of an oil spill. Mm-hmm. I understand that there was no reason to tanker that stuff out, because the environmentalists were saying, run a pipeline. Why are you doing something dangerous like moving oil by ship? Uh-uh. They said, well, because we can contain it. We've got these native crews. Well, after a couple years, they fired all the natives. Yeah. Okay. They they took their land. They fired them. It's the oldest game since Custer, you know. And they fired the natives. The problem was that left the entire coastline well, without they could, any protection. Yeah. Team, which they said existed. So what they did is they took people's names and they just made up made list, up stuff. Up, yeah. They, they made up jobs, made up. didn't they? They made up jobs. They made up training. They said, "Oh yeah, we have a standby group ready to do this if it's a problem." And it was a lie, a right. total lie. Okay. So l- let me take you forward now. Yeah. Justice David Souter, goof. I mean, absolute, utter goof, says uh, says in his order that Exxon should only have to pay 10% of what they were ordered to pay, basically. That's, that's about it. Yep. That he says that, look, Exxon was reckless, but, you know, they, they weren't reckless and stupid to make a profit. Therefore, they shouldn't have to pay punitive damages because it was pointless recklessness. I mean— 
can you get yeah. your head around that? Because you know what? Happened. I've practiced law for 25 years. I've handled every kind of punitive damage case that you can dream of, and I've never seen such a forced kind of analysis. Let me tell you something. Uh, you can't say you're a lawyer, but Justice Jackass there said these that Exxon didn't no, I can say profit. It, yeah. Didn't profit from the Exxon disaster. Let me tell you, they went 16 years without without the uh, buying the equipment, without having the emergency containment barge, et cetera. They saved billions of dollars, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. So by having to pay now only half a billion, they've literally turned it into a profit center. In other words, it's a, basically, it's a half billion dollars. That comes out to about $20, $30 million a year for a permit to spill. Think of it that way. Yeah. A few million bucks is a permit to spill. You don't have to have double hull tankers. They fought that successfully. You didn't have to have the equipment. You didn't have to have the crews. You didn't have to have the radar. Nothing. They literally saved billions of but dollars. But you know what they did is they outworked the natives. They, they, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the Exxon outworked Outlived the them. natives, and they outworked the message. And what they were able to say, and you even see it in Souter's opinion, that, you know, look, we're talking about a drunken skipper hits a reef, and therefore it's reckless, but gee, there was no profit involved. It was just the most outrageous, forced kind of uh, uh, reasoning that, you, that, that I've ever seen in a Supreme Court decision. I, and well, I've, he wasn't alone, remember. He had, oh, co- I, he had a co- co-conspirator named uh, Justice uh, Chief Justice yeah, Roberts, uh, of course. Who, who said, by the way, quote, in his opinion, what more could a corporation do? <laughs> uh, what he meant was, what I, well, they could do a lot more damage, but what more? What he meant was they they did everything that they could to yeah. prevent and clean up the spill. Polynesians. Okay, and, and let's talk about what the spill is. We're talking, so we don't lose sight. It's 11 million gallons of crude oil. That's right. It was estimated 85 tons of crude oil that's still not been, it's not even been removed to d- today. You go uh, to, uh, right. Exxon has been appealing this verdict since 1994, and you know what they've been telling the people in Alaska all along the way? Golly, we're sorry, we just have to work through the court system, but we want to pay you. We want to make yeah. sure we pay you. We want you to have this money. So a Ninth Circuit cut the initial award of about uh, $2.5 billion uh, down, and and the the company pays for they pay fines they pay all what three point five billion dollars in all this money but they never really get to the heart of the problem and that is you have eighty five tons of crude that are still it's still sitting there right you go to Sleepy Bay you go to the native islands right now and you just kick over pebbles and it smells like a gas station because it's this pebbly beaches. And, and it's still all over the place. I'm talking 20 years later. And and I want to emphasize something you just said. It's 20 years. Mm-hmm. 20 years now. The, the entire generation's years. gone, isn't and it? And we I mean, have not. The natives and the fishermen are still waiting to be paid. Well, some can't wait anymore. Just so you know, one in three of the original fishermen and the, and the original natives are dead. Mm-hmm. Paul Kompkoff, a friend of mine. OK, he just he asked me to fly to meet with Exxon and understand I worked with. Now, you talk about litigation before. Understand that before I was an investigative reporter, I worked for a living. I was an investigator and I worked with the natives and their legal team to run the investigation of fraud. Mm-hmm. OK, and uh, Paul, who was an elder of the Chiniga village, said, listen, talk to Exxon. I don't want to make a million dollars. What I want is a boat. Okay, I want a boat. I want a fishing permit. I want to get my life back together. Mm -hmm. I want to get this island back together because we're eating canned food. They're they're bringing in. You'll love this. He asked the president of of Exxon, who was there for a photo op on his island. Listen, Ken, you know, we don't eat this this McDonald's stuff that you're flying in. Mm -hmm. We eat seal meat. So they flew in seal meat and it said on the box is not fit for human consumption oh. zoo food okay it was, yeah. You know? yeah and so what happened was um paul just said give me a boat so i flew down for him the, the lawyer said go ahead talk to exxon see if they'll just you know settle up write a check put the let these villages come back to life mm-hmm. and i spoke to the head of exxon uh man manager of exxon usa a, a guy named otto harrison who said, you know, look, the spill's the best thing ever happened to the natives. Come on. Yeah, the, the, I love it. I, I was going to get to up, that. The spill, they get to clean up rocks. <laughs> yeah, the spill is the best thing that ever happened to these natives. Yeah, because they get, they're get they hired by Exxon for a couple months a year to clean the rocks 
Yeah. Right. So, so just a, just a quick rundown. Uh, it wasn't about a drunk captain. It wasn't about human frailty. No. It was about a broken radar, missing equipment, phantom spill teams that were never there but were promised, fake tests that were supposed to take place. Yeah. And it was, it was completely driven, not by human frailty, but by profit-driven greed. That's what happened here. Absolutely. And we have a U.S. Sup- and we have US, U.S. Supreme Court saying, what more could this company have done? Well, I got to tell you, Greg, it's the it's the same story we see almost every day. I, you know, I see it in pharmaceuticals. I see it in products liability cases. I see it just in just day after day where this is a country in con- the, the people in control are no longer. It's no longer you. It's no longer me. It's no longer government. It's corporate America is control of our lives. And this is a great story of how all that works. And yeah, and that's all my stories are this are the Exxon over and over again. 20 years to get paid, complete denial, a cover up of the truth and the con- co-conspirator in the cover up is the corporate American media. Yeah. Oh, which, absolutely. Which you know, I mean they keep giving the same story, poor Exxon and mm-hmm. and these greedy lawyers, yeah. okay? Now, now you're a lawyer, okay? But so but I'm going to defend so-called greedy lawyers. You know what? This is what I call our last ditch private justice system. There's no other way to get justice in America against the corporate bad guys because they will never do the right thing. There was no reason why Exxon which, whose president, by the way, made a statement, we will compensate everyone. Yeah. Don't worry. We on camera. Pay. Executives. On camera. Are, yeah. We got him saying it. Never did it. Resisted. These guys do not do the right thing. So you need you need sheriffs yeah. to come into town. Take was, the sheriffs it, it away. It wasn't going to be the, the Bush. What do you think? The Bush Justice Department is going to help you? Reagan's guys? Yeah. It was George Bush Sr. out of the oil patch who was president when the Exxon slammed the rocks. Yeah. And you know, where's the just the only justice you're going to get in America today is through a, a tough, tough plaintiff's bar. In other words, these are lawyers who sue on behalf of the public class actions. And this is what corporate America wants to stop. They call it tort reform. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, it's it sounds like like they're trying to, you know, um, get a hooker to, to, to get to out of the game To do something, something better for us. Right. <laughs> but, you know, it's 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 a con. And who, by the way, it's very important to understand that one of the great leaders of the tort reform movement was Ken Lay. Oh, of course. Of Exxon, because well, these guys know. Yeah. If they want to get away with the crime, they got to get the sheriffs out of town. Yeah. Since they bought the White House, the only thing left are the are lawyers who will sue yeah. on your behalf, and you, so they got to go you, after you, those guys. You may not like them, but it is the last line in the sand. Greg, i got to tell you, this is great work as usual. Um, it, it's just a good story. I, I, I could go on forever about your good stories, but this is one I, I think that people really need to, 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 to take a close look at because it, it's, it's the entire anatomy of good investigative journalism. Thanks for joining me.